As the son of a U.S. senator, Al Gore spent his childhood divided between the nation's capital and his family's farm in Tennessee. After graduating from Harvard, he spent 24 years in public office, culminating with his election as 45th Vice President of the United States. Since leaving the White House, Gore's environmental activism has earned him an Academy Award and the Nobel Peace Prize. We've got to stop treating the atmosphere as if it's an open sewer, and we've got to, to, to realize the consequences of continuing this. We hope to make more people aware of that. We're going to get through this, and on the other side of it, we can have a better world, more sustainable. Driven by this passion, Gore concentrates his efforts on initiatives that protect, preserve, and support the environment. The Climate Reality Project is dedicated to unleashing a global cultural movement demanding action on the climate crisis. Gore's interactive app, Our Choice, surveys the causes of global warming and presents groundbreaking insights and solutions. His Generation Investment Management is committed to investing in socially and environmentally responsible companies. In his latest book, The Future, Gore writes, Human civilization has reached a fork in the road we have long traveled. One of two paths must be chosen. Both lead us into the unknown, but one leads toward the destruction of the climate balance on which we depend, the depletion of irreplaceable resources that sustain us, the degradation of uniquely human values, and the possibility that civilization as we know it would come to an end. The other leads to the future. Urgency is the key message, because the sooner we start, uh, the better chance we're going to have uh, of solving this. And again, I'm optimistic. I think we're going to do it. I'm encouraged. But uh, time's a wasting. <laughs>
involves dealing with some really uh, dangerous uh, potential realities, but it certainly gives you the feeling that it's worth pouring everything you've got into it. Now, let me also add that when I first became a congressman back, I was elected in 1976, when I first had the privilege of having these town hall meetings or open meetings as I called them all across my congressional district in Middle Tennessee, um, it was an amazing experience. A and even though, according to the design of our founders, I was trying to convince my constituents that I was worthy of being reelected uh, when the time came and I was trying to show them I was effective and doing the best for them, it, it, it was obvious that it, it was bigger than that. And the, the, the chance to be a part of this uh, American constitutional design really and truly gave me a, a thrill in, in my heart that is difficult to describe in words. It sounds corny, but it was really an amazing experience. And how many times in your life have you had that experience? Because you've had it many times, have you not? Yeah, I have. Um, being a part of elected, uh, the elected uh, government of the U.S. Uh, was a thrill. I have to say this, Michael, that over the, the years that I served in government, uh, I have to be candid and tell you that I saw a, um, a steady uh, decline in the quality of uh, governance and the um, uh, the the, the quality of the institutions, the, the influence of large contributions began to get reach unhealthy levels. When I went to the Congress, the total lobbying expenditures were a hundred million. Uh, this year I think it's above three billion. Uh, when the climate legislation was pending before the Congress, there were four anti-climate lobbyists for every single member of the House and Senate. And you know, if Michael Jordan had been covered by four defensive players every step he took on the court, it, he wouldn't have scored as much. Uh, and w when I went to the Congress, I would say that no more than one or two, maybe three or four percent of the retired members of the House and Senate became lobbyists. This year, 50 percent of the retired senators are lobbyists, and 40 percent of the retired House members. But in spite of that, uh, that, that process of, of degradation in democracy, sorry to put it that way, but that's, you know, our, our, our government's, our democracy's been hacked. It, it, it really has been, it doesn't work. There's not a single reform that can pass if it impinges on the interests of any significant special interest. It's kind of pathetic, really. The, you, you know, background checks for gun purchases, 90% of the American people are in favor of it, but, but they can't possibly pass it. There's no reform that's significant that can pass now. But in spite of all that, the, the time that I was privileged to serve in our, uh, in, in our government, I, I really found it uh, to be a tremendous privilege and a thrill. Yeah. Well, let's touch a little bit about the hacking of government, because yeah. you've you devote a good deal of uh, time in that to the book, and we're going to be getting, I have to point out, the, the, the book, of course, uh, The Future and uh, Six Drivers of Global Change. Um, there are copies for sale in the back, uh, and uh, I will sign later. I get 10% of every sale, so please. <laughs> I, I forgot to tell you that. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> we'll I get it hey, I'm for the market system. <laughs> okay, that's good. Hawk it some more. <laughs> a little later, I'll get to it. But, you know, one of the things you do touch upon is what you see happening to, to governance. Let, yeah. let's, let's take a step back and say, how did it happen? You've been involved in, in, you know, in government for 40 years. You've, been, yeah. you've seen things change. Uh, we've had here at the conference other uh, elected officials who bemoaned that and people who have different reasons yeah. for doing it. Uh, but how, what do you think happened to get to the point we are now? Well, I'll give you the simple answer, and then I'll give you a little bit more uh, textured answer. Yeah. The, the simple answer is that the role of big money in politics ha has now uh, reached an unhealthy degree. And the, the hack, as I put it, is pretty simple to understand. When I first went to the House of Representatives, I described the feeling mm -hmm. that I had and the way I spent my time. I had five open meetings per week mm -hmm. for all the time I was in the Congress. 
And honestly, that, that thrill that I described mm -hmm. motivated me to do so much. And when I voted and spoke and uh, introduced legislation, mm -hmm. it was with my constituents primarily in mind. And that's what our founders intended. The difference today is, is uh, pretty, pretty stark because over those four decades, what we have seen is the rise of television at the expense of uh, the, the printing press. And the, the printing press created, you know, when our country was founded, yeah. uh, Thomas Paine wrote uh, Common Sense and walked out his front door in Philadelphia. There were a dozen low-cost print shops within a few square blocks. And he got it printed. It became the Harry Potter of the late 18th century and helped to ignite uh, the American Revolution. Yeah. Uh, but in the last third of the 20th century, broadcasting displaced the print media. And a modern Thomas Paine with a two-hour video called Common Sense mm -hmm. walks out his front door in Philadelphia down to the nearest TV station or to Comcast or any of them and says, okay, I've got this video, it's gonna change the world, it's gonna change history. When do I go on the air? Well, he doesn't go on the air <laughs> because he needs $10 million or more to, to buy the time. There, there is a bottleneck guarded by gatekeepers that charge exorbitant sums of money and the, and the only people that have access to the public's mind are those with huge amounts of money. And, and political candidates, including elected officials running for re-election, have to get that money from somewhere. And there are people ready to give it to them. They represent special interests who are primarily uh, interested in particular pieces of, of legislation. And you know, none of these are bad people. They're good people for the most part trapped in a bad system. But here's the upshot. A, a newly elected member of the House or Senate today goes for the orientation briefing. And the first thing they tell him or her is, okay, by the time your re-election comes up, two years from now or six years from now, you're going to need X amount of money, and it's a big number. Uh, and we've calculated that you have to raise 15, 20, 30, depending on the state or district, thousand dollars every single day from today through your election. And so they end up spending, on average, five hours a day making phone calls and going to cocktail parties, begging rich people and special interests for money in order to get reelected. Now here's the difference between the kind of the incentive structure that I walked into when I was first elected and the one they move into. While I was had the privilege of spending most of my time relating to my constituents and taking their hopes and desires and concerns to, back to Washington and interpreting them. Mm -hmm. and, and if I found out stuff was different from what I told them, I'd go back and explain it. And it's the way our system's supposed to work. By contrast, today, if a member of Congress spends five hours every day begging special interests for money, human nature being what it is, when they vote the next day or the next week, they're naturally going to be thinking about what impact it will have on their success in raising money from special interests. Uh, and and that's, that, that's the hack. Now, I, I'll complete my answer quickly with the textured version. I referred to <clears throat> the, the big tectonic shift in the nature of the way we communicate in our democracy. The printing press had very low entry barriers for individuals. It was a give and take culture. You, uh, individuals could get the knowledge previously reserved for elites, but they could also contribute their own ideas, and they, their contributions would be treated roughly in the manner of a Google search today. The more people who found it resonated with them, the, the higher in popularity it would grow. And so ideas uh, came to have enough substance and, and power to displace money and uh, force of arms and wealth which have been throughout the majority of human history the, the, the coin of the realm where power is concerned. Now when broadcasting displaced print, that changed. And in addition to requiring lots of money to gain access to the public mind, television has been a one-way medium. The average American watches television five hours per day. There's a direct connection between the five hours they watch and the five hours that political figures spend raising money. Uh, and yet, you can talk back to the TV, but it doesn't hear you. 
Uh, and, and so it has been, it has had a very depressing and degrading impact on democracy. Now, the good news is that this wheel is turning again and the internet is rising in power and importance. It is still, believe it or not, kind of a bit player compared to TV. If you measure advertising dollars, 80% of the money spent by both yeah. political parties goes for 30 second TV ads. But the internet is coming on so strong, so strongly, that we are not far from the time where once again individuals will have easier access to the public mind. Well, don't you think that that's likely to happen first with um, younger to middle-aged uh, uh, voters? But, or do you think that there's a chance that it'll impact senior population sooner? Because they are, of course, a segment of the voting population that people look to because they vote so regularly. Yeah, I think that's a good point. There is a generational divide. Young people are far more likely to move into the internet and stop watching TV as, as much. Uh, most uh, TV, most web-based video now is watched on big screens though. So the power and persistence of this medium. We have a kind of a receptor for television uh, and, and I mean that not just in a metaphorical sense but our ancient ancestors on the African savanna uh, sitting in a circle when the, when, when the bushes moved, the ones who didn't look are not our ancestors. Yeah. Uh, and, and that- you're, you're talking about the bushes that, are, that grow, correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I seldom talk about the other kind. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but that, the, the psychologists call that the establishing reflex uh, or the orientation reflex. And television triggers that once every couple of seconds. And so one of the reasons why one of the most valuable things in TV is a lead-in show is that people fall into a quasi-trance state. Don't take that too literally, but yeah. you've yeah. seen it happen. Uh, and they don't have the energy to move a thumb muscle to change the channel. Uh, and, and, and so they absorb all this uh, uh, advertising. Now, the use of the internet is, even though young people are much more likely, you know, the average user of social games is a 40-year-old woman. Uh, and older people are using the internet in surprisingly large numbers. It is such a phenomenon, particularly social media, uh, and it is still growing off the charts. And it will not be long before television sinks into the digital universe. Now, one, let, let's just, you view, as we take one step back and you look at the, the influence of money on politics. Do you view that in any way a partisan issue? Do you think it cuts across both parties? Oh, it cuts across both parties, for sure. No, it's a bipartisan issue, just as both parties spend 80% of their money on 30-second TV yeah. ads. And these 30-second TV ads are not the Federalist Papers, by the way. They don't really uh, speak to our higher uh, instincts. They, you, you know, we've all seen way too many of them. They press the hot buttons and they're mainly designed to make us think terrible things about the candidate's opposition and both, both or all candidates in a race right. succeed in making everybody think badly about all of right. them. And, and so participation rates have been going down. Uh, so no, it's, uh, it's not a partisan issue. Now, yeah. I, I will say that, uh, and you take this with a grain of salt because you know I'm oriented in the Democratic Party. I'm not thrilled about the Democratic Party, but that's still where my roots are and my orientation is. But, and, and the Democratic Party has been uh, seduced by the role of money in politics as well. I do think from my partisan standpoint, but I, I believe it, that the Republican Party by and large as uh, styling itself as the party of business, the anti-government party in recent years, uh, is probably a little bit more into this and probably way more represented on K Street and Washington, but it's, you know, a pox on both their houses. Well, let me touch on one other aspect of uh, that the money plays into, but it's also difficult in decision making. Um, and uh, that's the issue of uh, redistricting, narrow districts, and yeah. the extent to which uh, people uh, in both the House and the Senate are often more worried about a challenge from uh, their own party, yeah, yeah. either left or right, than they are just the, the, the other side. Yeah. Uh, and to some extent, of course, that has an influence on people's willing to, willingness to compromise. 
Yeah. What do you see as the answer to that, if you see one? Well, I think the whole country ought to adopt the California procedure, where you have a, you know, an objectively uh, uh, designed, uh, scientifically driven redistricting process that doesn't pay any attention to what the incumbent uh, uh, officials in both parties want. When you have uh, districts that are designed to protect incumbents, you're exactly right, Michael. What that means is that the, the, the primary uh, contest becomes the, the main contest. So the influence of the Tea Party, for example, which, you know, it's a complicated phenomenon. If you want to get into it, I will. But, it, you know, it's, it has a lot of what they call astroturf to it. It's kind of, you know, some good people have been misled by this. But you take these uh, Republican candidates on the right, they are terrified more than anything else of a challenge from a, a Tea Party person c coming in. Uh, and, you know, to some extent that may be self-corrective on a statewide basis. You saw it in Indiana uh, last time uh, with the, uh, well, you're, I can't remember the guy's name now, but there, there was just this unfortunate penchant for throwing around uh, phrases about rape, which they should have uh, understood was a formula yeah. for disaster for him. But then the Democrat wins in the general election. Yeah. Uh, but on a, on a House district basis, it doesn't happen that way because the, the partisan redistricting drives both parties toward their extremes and, and it, it contributes to the polarization of the Congress and the country. Yeah. Let me move away, not completely from this discussion, but I'd like to focus a little bit directly on your, more directly on your book. Thank you. Um, uh, which, by the way, is for sale in the back of any characters. Have that. Um, this it is, in fact, a uh, obviously incredibly thoroughly and wonderfully researched book. It's a very literate, which is unusual today. Uh, any book uh, this this warms my heart to the University of Chicago graduate, uh, but that it be, in the opening chapter it has a discussion, uh, an explanation of entropy, and in the closing chapter uh, it has a uh, quote of Marcus Aurelius, and I, I think. Any book that has that span, you should be, <laughs> be uh, uh, definitely congratulated for. But you do talk about six drivers. They're very interconnected. Yeah. And um, I know it's difficult to summarize a book in a few minutes, uh, especially one uh, as uh, uh, highly thought out as this. But I'd like you to do two things first, if I can. One, let me just ask you, how did you come to write the book? Yeah. What's your process putting it together? And then just talk briefly about those six drivers. Yeah, okay, well, thank you. Eight years ago, I made a speech in um, Switzerland, uh, and in the Q&A, someone uh, asked me, what are the drivers of global change? And I gave a, an answer off the top of my head that I you know, thought was adequate. And then uh, the following morning, when I got on the plane to fly back to the US, the question kind of kept nagging at me because I thought I could do better than that. And I took out my computer and started doing an outline and I found that that, that that question would not leave me alone because I kept filling in the outline. And um, a couple of years, uh, well, right at that time, I had co-founded an investment firm, Generation Investment Management, with uh, my, my co-founder, David Blood, who was the former CEO of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. And I really wanted to name the firm Blood and Gore, incidentally. Uh, but. <laughs> Uh, you didn't have the guts to do it? No, I had, I, 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 I hope I had the, I had the guts and I, I hope you won't think less of me when I tell you I really did want to yeah. name it that. But, and David was willing, but the other partners just wouldn't yeah. go along with it. It would have had instant brand recognition, but, but anyway, um, our model uh, is uh, sustainable investing. And if you want to get into that, I'd be thrilled to. We I, I intend to before we finish. Sustainable on. capitalism. But when we were building our investment model, uh, this outline that I had worked on became one of the uh, uh, significant inputs into our in investment model. And my partners uh, don't like me to speak expansively about our performance, but it's done really well for nine years now. We've beaten uh, the uh, market benchmarks for nine years. And that gave me uh, some confidence that there was extra value in this uh, outline. And I kept working on it. And my partners had advice. And I, uh, I began to see things that fit in. 
And then a couple of years ago, a little more than that now, I decided uh, that it was worth turning it into a book. And John Meacham had just moved to Random House, and I thought he would be a great editor, which he was. And so I, I put together a research team and developed uh, 15,000 pages of research, moved all the furniture out of the living room and put up giant whiteboards in Nashville, and uh, this book resulted from it. Good. And um, are you happy with it? I am very happy with it, yes. Good. And uh, I, um, well, I really encourage you to read it, not just because I want you to buy it, but if you are interested in the process of global change, uh, it will be worth your while. I know I'm biased and all that, but I've really put my heart and soul in this. There's yeah. a lot in it, uh, and it, it is, uh, it's densely packed. Yeah. Uh, so you have to make a commitment to it, but it will be worth your while. Uh, definitely. Well, tell, tell us briefly, because I recognize, have you read it, it's very difficult to succinctly yeah. summarize, but just briefly, the six changes. Yeah, okay, uh, the first driver of global change I call Earth Inc., mm -hmm. which is a much more deeply interconnected global economy that has now taken on uh, a reality and integrity of its own. Uh, the, the globalization of the economy and the financialization of the economy and the emergence of ubiquitous business models that operate in the global sphere have really changed the relationship between business and governance at the local, regional, and national level and, and global level. Uh, you look at the sovereign wealth funds. Uh, sovereign wealth funds emerged partly as a defense to the kind of experience that the Asian financial crisis revealed. There are all these countries now whose national economies are uh, hostage to the whims of these uh, global financial flows. If you take the 100 largest economies in the world, 53 of them are corporations. And many of these multinationals have supply chains running to dozens uh, of countries. And every business, almost every business now defines its strategic terrain in the global dimension. Uh, and I talk about the trends in uh, Earth Inc. and the, the emergence of new technologies like 3D uh, printing and so forth. And I'll, I, there's so much more. But the yeah. second driver of global change is what I call the global mind, a network of networks that connects uh, the thoughts and feelings of billions of people uh, to one another and also to a growing proliferation of intelligent devices and embedded systems and intelligent machines. Uh, the global mind is changing the way we organize our thinking. Uh, it's changing business models, governance, uh, organizational forms of all kinds. And it is growing very, very rapidly. Uh, there will be in just three years 50 billion uh, devices, intelligent devices connected to the global mind. Already, as some of you know, the flow of information on the Internet of Things is way larger than the flow of information among people. And the, the way it's transforming everything is just astonishing. I'll give you one quick uh, exotic example. Uh, these Swiss dairy farmers uh, face the problem that a lot of dairy farmers face where the modern milking machines and scientific diets uh, increase production but serve to compress the estrus cycle of the cattle mm -hmm. so that when they want to breed the cows to get calves, they, they really have to be on their toes because they, the cows come into heat mm -hmm. for a shorter period of time. So their solution has been to embed devices into the cow so when the cow comes into heat, she t texts the farmer. Uh, <laughs> it's the first known example yeah. of interspecies sexting. Mm. Um, and uh, there are so many other examples in the book. And of course, the emergence of uh, ever more efficacious forms of artificial intelligence connected to the global mind uh, will also supercharge this transformation. Uh, I, I talk about the history and the future of this. and. There's, there's so much I can't really cover it. The third, in, in this short talk, uh, the third is the epic shift. It's called the imbalance of power. The, the, uh, political, economic, and eventually military power are now shifting in the world more profoundly than at any time in the last 500 years when European nations discovered uh, the Americas. Uh, power is shifting from 
west to east and being redistributed to multiple emerging centers of, of power uh, in the developing and emerging uh, economy. Uh, power is also shifting from political systems to markets and toward individuals and groups of individuals. Uh, and the rise of China is emblematic of it, but if you put it in a larger context, for most of the last two millennia, China and India were the largest economies in the world. And the Industrial Revolution, starting in England and spreading to Western Europe and North America, represented a quarter millennium breakout for the West. And now that the internet and the transportation revolution of the second half of the 20th century is, is distributing technological power throughout the world, there is a reversion to the mean with China and India moving back to the size. They're, they're now the number two and three economies in the world. And China, of course, will quickly become the number one economy in the world, already is in manufacturing and all these other metrics. Uh, but power is being redistributed within nations uh, as well. Uh, the corporation as an institution now occupies a, a position roughly comparable to that occupied by the medieval church during the Middle Ages in, in Europe. Uh, and the, the development of corporate personhood as a legal doctrine, or rather the expansion of it, it really came in the, in the, in the middle of the 19th century, but it's been expanded uh, dramatically. Uh, it is now uh, a, a completely different world where the distribution of power uh, is concerned. Uh, let me move on. Chapter four is called Outgrowth. And we, uh, one of the principal drivers of change is growth, which is defined in a, we define growth in a weird way, GDP and the accounts that derive from GDP. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just cover that briefly in a moment. But growth in consumption, uh, growth in, in use of raw materials, growth in flows of pollution, growth in financial flows, growth in population. You know, it took 200,000 years for the human population to reach one billion. We've added one billion in the first 13 years of this century. We'll add another billion in the next 14 years and another billion yet 16 years after that, and where it stops, nobody knows. Maybe it'll level off at 10, uh, maybe 11, maybe nine and a half. They really don't know, and for reasons we can go into uh, if you want. We will add three billion people to the global middle class within the next 17 years. That's truly astonishing. Uh, and whenever the middle class grows, there are demands for democracy and better governance and fairer uh, distributions uh, of wealth. But let me talk for a moment about distribution of income and wealth. GDP, which is the touchstone of our business accounting system and national accounting system, was uh, formed and created in 1937 by a man named Simon Kuznets. He was greatly honored. He said at the time, please don't use GDP as a basis for national economic policy but we are vulnerable to the use of heuristics or shortcuts that become, uh, that come to be seen as uh, capturing everything. And he said, this is a real danger because it leaves out a lot of stuff. Better than what they had before, what does it leave out? Externalities, both negative and positive. Pollution flows uh, are not measured, not, not included in the accounts. Positive externalities are not, are not included. So for example, if we invest in uh, mental health care and better education and community services, that counts as an expense. But years later, as the positive benefits come flowing back in, they are not measured. So most nations, including principally the United States, chronically underinvest in public goods that have positive externalities. Distribution of income is not measured. So we have rising levels of income and net worth inequality in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, in China, in India, in Brazil, in virtually every country in the entire world, with a few small exceptions in South America where they've been down so long it looks like up to them. But inequality is growing rapidly. In our country, in the US here, I know there are many non-Americans here, in the US, since the recovery began, such as it is, 
93% of the additional income we've earned in the last two and a half years has gone to the wealthiest 1%. That's not an Occupy Wall Street slogan. That is a hard and fast statistic. But that counts as an undiluted positive good in GDP. We've, we've had all this increase in income. That's a big win. Well, for 99% of the people, it's not a, a, a big win. And so that has to be... Uh, uh, it has to be changed. I get the impression that you feel somewhat passionate about this. I do, I do. You know, if you're, if, if you're, if you're going on a journey and your compass, ha your compass is flawed, you're going to go in the wrong direction. And this compass is taking us off the edge of a cliff. Now, the fifth uh, driver of global change uh, is, well, I could say much more about uh, the growth thing, but I, I, I really can't, I don't have time. The fifth is the reinvention of life and death, which covers the revolution in the life sciences and material sciences. We now have acquired the ability to change the fabric of life itself and the makeup of all solid matter. Uh, and it is an extremely powerful revolution that is going to change a, a lot. Le again, let me give you another arcane example. Uh, I, 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 I'm sure probably nobody here has spider goats. Okay, uh, spider go. It, spider silk is incredibly valuable. Uh, it's flexible and it's very strong. If you want to stop a plane on an aircraft carrier when it lands, this is really great for that. Lots of other uses. But how do you get a lot of spider silk? Well, you can't farm spiders. They're aggressive and cannibalistic, and those are only two of the reasons I don't want to farm spiders. Uh, but here's what you can do. You can take the genes from orb-weaving spiders and splice them into goats and create spider goats that will then have baby spider goats. And they look like goats, but they secrete spider silk in their milk through their udders. Everybody okay with that? This, the, this, Which is is the new, then, this is the new definition of the World Wide Web? <laughs> In all the interviews I've done on this book, you are the first one to pick that Sorry up. Sorry about Very that. Very good. I didn't, I, I great. Uh, but it also allows us to pick traits in human children. We, we have the technical ability to clone human beings now. We don't. That's not being done so far as we know because of ethical safeguards. Uh, but there are, there is work underway that is absolutely mind-blowing. The Beijing Genomic Institute, for example, is far larger, better funded, more extensive than anything in the U.S., than everything in this field in the U.S. And their efforts now to select for intelligence, a lot of people think they won't be able to do it because it's such a complex challenge, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the change in the makeup of solid matter. We are now recombining uh, atoms uh, and molecules to create brand new materials. Now, one quick final note on this chapter, and that is that our short-term thinking, which is reinforced in the business world by the obsession with quarterly reports yeah. and the, the measuring systems that we use, I referred to them earlier, if we use that kind of short-term thinking to make decisions about the genetic future of the human species, uh, we're gonna get into real trouble because you know parents are competitive. Uh, you look at the, you know, the concentration enhancing drugs like Ritalin and Adderall that are just epidemic in so many schools now. Uh, when we have the ability to select traits that make children more competitive, the, the, the impulse to use that is going to be irresistible for some people, some nations. Uh, and if we use these short-term decision-making standards, we can do serious uh, damage. Now, the final uh, driver of global change is the climate crisis and the beginnings of the worldwide uh, energy and efficiency revolution that is going to be necessary to solve the climate crisis. Many of you have heard me talk about this before, so I'll be uh, brief on this one. But we are dumping 90 million tons of global warming pollution every day into the thin shell of atmosphere surrounding our planet as if it is an open sewer. And it traps a lot of extra energy. The accumulation of man-made global uh, warming pollution now up there uh, 
traps enough extra energy every 24 hours to equal the energy contained in 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs being set off every day. It's a big planet, but that's a lot of energy. It's heating up the, uh, the, the atmosphere and the biosphere and the oceans, uh, and it's radically changing the hydrological or water cycle. More uh, moisture, water vapor is evaporating off the oceans. Warmer air holds much more, so you get these much bigger downpours and bigger floods. It pulls the moisture out of the soil. 61% uh, of our um, uh, uh, country was in deep drought last year. Uh, the heat stress alone is hurting crop yields and will continue to. The United States of America last year had the hottest year in history. We had $110 billion in climate-related disaster damage. We're not gonna be able to afford, to afford the escalation of these climate-related disasters. And, and just to keep pouring on more of the problem, I, you know, I know there's a lot of denial out there and there's a, you know, an unwillingness to, and there's an organized campaign to say it's not real. But, uh, you know, the, when I first appeared here and did my slideshow and the movie that came out of it, the single uh, most criticized part of that movie and slideshow was when I showed this animation uh, of what sea level rise and storm surges would do to Manhattan. And I showed how the World Trade Center Memorial site would fill up with ocean water. And the skeptics and deniers said, that's ridiculous and demagogic. Well, unfortunately, it happened at the end of last October, way ahead of schedule. And more will happen. Damage has already been cooked into this system. But what can still be avoided is the truly catastrophic results. So um, yeah, you're right, I'm passionate about this. But I want to make uh, a, a direct appeal to each and every one of you here. Please be a part of the solution to this. This is for real. It is not made up. The scientists are not in a conspiracy to lie to us and fabricate these, these, uh, these findings. Every single National Academy of Science on this planet agrees with it. Are they all lying to get grants? Please. Every, every professional scientific society. Uh, Munich Re says there's no other plausible explanation for what is happening. And the generation of people alive today will be held accountable. And, and our children and grandchildren will have an occasion to ask one of two questions in the future. If they live in a world that is being devastated by these uh, consequences that have been predicted and are now beginning to unfold, they would be well justified in asking of us, what in the hell were you thinking and what in the hell were you doing? Why were you so willfully blind to what was happening on your watch? If, on the other hand, they live in a world that is experiencing a renewal with solar and wind and efficiency and third generation biofuels and better architecture and design and sustainable agriculture and sustainable forestry and tens of millions of people being put to work and a sense of hope in their hearts, they could look back, they will look back and ask uh, of us, how did you find the moral courage to awaken from your stupor and start doing things differently? Thank you for what you did. And part of the answer will be that a lot of you came to Michael Milken's Global Conference in 2013. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But, but other, than, other than that, are you worried? <laughs> well, I am optimistic, and, and, and let me just tell you why. Because in spite of the direness of these challenges and the incredibly difficult choices we have to make. Uh, by the way, the United States remains the only nation that can lead the world. Uh, that's not just an expression of unbounded pride in the US. Uh, who, else, who else can do it? You know, it has to be a combination of values-based leadership, economic strength, political strength, military strength, uh, people, trust, uh, people trusting that leadership. The, there is no other country but the U.S. And the, even though we are witnessing the emergence of Earth, Inc. and a global civilization, 
the, the nation state will still be the primary unit of account and action at the global level will still have to be designed and undertaken by a community of, of nations that requires leadership. So those of us who are citizens of the U.S. have a double opportunity by transforming the efficacy and competence and integrity of U.S. government and restoring our founders' design so, so that the wisdom of crowds uh, can operate again so we stop making all these dumbass decisions like invading Iraq when they had nothing to do with 9-11, not doing anything about the uh, derivatives uh, that, that cratered uh, uh, the, the credit system in the world and triggered, I, I could go on and on. W we have an opportunity to, to really make the critical difference. Now, the good news is this, when consciousness changes, then political changes can occur with dizzying speed. It's nonlinear. I remember as a kid in the times that I was in Tennessee when the Civil Rights Revolution was won. The conversations were won. Some, one of my friends that made some racist comment, another friend said, hey man, shut up. We don't talk that way anymore. And that happened in millions of conversations. And the laws changed. Two months ago, two gay men are waiting in line for a pizza and holding hands. And some homophobe comes by and makes a nasty comment. And according to the newspaper account, literally every other person in that line turned on him and say, hey, shut up. We don't put up with that. We are winning that conversation. We won it on apartheid. The Berlin Wall came down in a single day. When we realize the, the reality of our situation, that we're destroying the conditions in our home. That, and, and by the way, we're not going to another planet. We couldn't even evacuate New Orleans. This is our, our home, okay? And, and when, people, when people realize uh, what the reality is, then the, the laws and policies can change very quickly. And, and besides that, the cost of solar and wind are coming down very, very dramatically. The more we use, the faster it comes down. The more coal and oil we use, the more it goes up in price. Those lines are crossing in many countries right now. We've got the wind uh, in our sails, no pun intended. We really, we really do have a lot of good things going for us. Business is ahead of governments. Uh, a lot of families are making changes. But, but as important as it is to change the light bulbs, it's way more important to change the laws and incentives. And the United States has to lead that. And since the United States government is sclerotic and dysfunctional and pathetic and paralyzed, we the people have to lift it back up and make it work again. It's just that simple. All right, we only have a few minutes left. You're a capitalist now. I mean, yeah, yeah. I know you, you know, it's a dirty word, but, but we welcome, to you, to the, we welcome you to the club. We're happy to have, have, you, uh, have you doing it. Uh, and uh, you've done very well with it in terms of your returns and your investments. Um, tell me a little bit of how you as a capitalist think the business world can operate, the business sector can operate in a way that helps to deal with some of the issues that you've raised. Well, it has been utterly fascinating for me to, to get into business. I've only, I've only been in it for you know, a little over 12 years now. I've been very fortunate to have great partners uh, in uh, David Blood, Joel Hyatt, John Doerr. Uh, it, it's, it's really been um, a, a, a thrill for me. And I've loved every minute of it. But it's, it's also been fascinating to see how some of the problems that have emerged in democracy have in different forms emerged in, in capitalism. Uh, David and I, David Blood and I fight for what we call sustainable capitalism. Let me just give you a couple of examples. I know we don't have much time. Short-termism is a buzzword that most of the business people here know about. It's a really serious problem. Uh, BNA, a great uh, business research institution found a few years ago in a famous study, they asked questions of a lot of CEOs and CFOs, and one of them was a hypothetical. Here's an investment you can make in your business that will make your business more profitable, more sustainable, it meets all your internal investment targets, but there's one issue, if you make this investment, you will slightly miss your next quarterly earnings report. Given those facts, will you make the investment? 80% of American CEOs and CFOs said no, no. Uh, and, and, and the focus on these short-term metrics 
is functionally insane. That, that hurts the business. It hurts the shareholders, the employees, everybody involved in the business. And now, of course, uh, between 50 and 60 percent of the trades in both London and New York are made by high-speed algorithmic trading in milliseconds. Uh, 30 years ago, the average holding period for equities was roughly seven years. Now it's less than five months. Well, the organic process of real value creation is about a business cycle and a half. If you're getting in and out in you know, a tiny fraction of that time, then it's kind of an exercise in uh, guessing where the herd is going next, and it does not optimize investment. Also, uh, the, the value spectrum. You know, we focus on uh, the, the numbers on the Bloomberg screens, and the quarterly reports are some of it, but you know, if you were invested in BP before Deepwater Horizon, you wouldn't see anything measuring the degradation and loss of their safety culture. But when they expanded into the US, they did not drive their safety culture. There are ways to, to, to measure that. And, and environmental factors, the treatment of communities, the treatment of employees, uh, there's, you, you know, if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum from uh, radio waves to gamma rays and infrared, all that, the, there's a very tiny slice that measures the part that's visible to the human eye. We come to think that's all that matters. But when I was in the White House, I started every day with an hour long at least briefing with the intelligence community. They collected data, trust me, from the entire spectrum. And it was a much more complete picture. Well. What we do at Generation, and what I think is best practice for any investor, is to look not just at the traditional metrics, which are still damn important, of course, uh, and dominant, but look at the rest of the spectrum. It takes a different way of looking at it. That's sustainable capitalism. We need to do that. And we need to align incentives. If you're a pension fund, for example, your fiduciary obligation is to match the performance of your assets over time to the maturation of your liabilities. But if you turn over the management of those assets to people who you compensate on a quarterly or annual basis, hey, uh, don't be surprised if they maximize the performance according to what benefits them the most. As I say, I've only been in business a dozen years, but one of the things I've learned is that often people will do what you pay them to do. Uh, and, and if you pay them to maximize for the short term, that will come at the expense of what they're supposed to be doing. We are short on long and long on short. Uh, and we need to match the performance of business and investing to the organic people-centered processes by which real value is created. And if you want to learn more about this, it's in the book, but it's also at a paper uh, at the Generation IM website where David and I have written extensively on sustainable capitalism. Well, Al, on that note, let me just make a comment or two as we're running out of time. Uh, your book points to a number of trends which, unless they are changed and altered, will keep the readers up at night. So I do advise you about that when you, when you read it. Uh, but you also are very hopeful. And one statistic we love to cite here at the Milken Institute is that um, in 1977, there were 174 people in the United States who listed themselves as Elvis impersonators. This is, of course, because it's Tennessee, so I had to bring this in. Uh, in the year uh, for which we have most recent statistics, there were 84,000. If that trend continues, <laughs> By the year 2050, one third of all the people in the world <laughs> that be, could happen, you know, would be Elvis impersonators. <laughs> so, one we, of them was just uh, charged I, in the ricin case. He was, but right? he was released, so he goes back on the oh, road. Oh, he, he was being, falsely you know, he was accused. Falsely yeah. accused, right? Today, so, today. So, you know, there is something that says that trends <laughs> don't necessarily continue unabated, right. and one of the reasons they don't is that people take action. They change the facts. They change the, the way in which the world operates. Uh, you have been doing that. You, are, you have devoted yourself to trying to change those trends. Uh, you were obviously reserved in talking about them, but we, uh, we, <laughs> we recognize that. And we commend you for that. The one trend we also want you to change 
if we want it to be less than six or seven years before the next time you come uh, to the Milken Institute Global Conference. So, Al, thank you so much. Thank for you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. It's great. Thank you yeah. very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. And Al will be in back autographing books. <laughs>